welcome to our workshop tonight. We are so happy that you're joining us this evening. Um, if you are joining us for the first time live, um, please feel free to comment. If you are watching after the broadcast, you may put your comments in the chat. It may just take us a little longer to respond. Community Homeworks is a nonprofit organization with the mission to empower homeowners to maintain safe, safe, sustainable, and dignified homes. We get our funding from grants, gifts, and donations, so if you find value in this workshop tonight, we encourage you to donate on our website at communityhomeworks.org. This evening's workshop is called Ventilation and Air Conditioning. With the days getting hotter, it's going to be sh important that you know how to maintain your units if you have one. And our instructor tonight is none other than the magnificent Mr. Lee Taylor. Mr. Taylor, we are so happy that you are here with us tonight, and we look forward to learning more about ventilation and air conditioning. All right. <coughs> well, again, you know, like I said, this is ventilation and air conditioning. Uh, if you guys have questions, either online or, you know, in person, let us know. That will, we can hopefully be able to answer it and... If we don't have an answer, it's a good way to build our program, right? So, and figure out what people are needing. So I'd like to ask the, the audience, did you guys come here with a specific question that you were looking to get out of this class tonight? No, just info, okay. Okay, the maintenance side of all this. Yeah, that's always a big, big thing. So, all right. And like I said, if you think of something, shout it out. <laughs> we'll be able to get to it. Um, what we're going to be talking about tonight is just understanding, you know, how ventilation plays into, you know, the into your home and how important it is as far as uh, indoor air pollution, that sort of stuff. Uh, we'll talk about the, the routine maintenance that you need to do for if you have a ventilation system uh, and your AC um, and how to, you know, what you can do on your own and what you can't. Um, we'll talk about uh, some of the basic common problems that you're going to find with your AC and your ventilation. And we'll talk about... Um, different types of air conditioning, window units versus central air versus a few others, and kind of the pros and cons on both, because there's always, there's always a pro and there's always a con, so. Um, and then we'll be talking about how your home, how your home's construction impacts your need for ventilation or air conditioning or sizing or anything along that line, so. The related workshops, pick one. Well, not really pick one, but most of them are, are, are into this. this. This class used to be HVAC, which stood for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, but there was just way too much. So we broke it up into two different parts. Um, but, you know, heating systems, spring, summer maintenance, fall, winter maintenance, weatherization, all that is all related. So I want to go through and, and uh, just a real quick rundown on some terms I'm going to be using. So there are a couple of different ways of, of how houses can be built. And, and we're talking in terms of how easily air from the outside moves in or out, okay? So we'll start with, say, a loose construction home. So what, what we're talking about with that is, is that it's, it's drafty, it costs a fortune to heat, costs a fortune to cool, right? That's a loose construction home. Then there's a moderate, well, somewhere in between. Then there's what is called a tight, or a tight construction home, or Energy Star, a lot of people think of it that way. And that's where not much air uh, from the outside or inside can move in or out on its own. It has to be mechanically pulled in or expelled. So if I say, you know, this is a, an example of a tight construction or loose construction, that's it, basically what I'm talking about. And I know both of you have older homes, 
So, you know, as far as what we're going to be dealing with, and that's usually what most people are dealing with is, is, a, is a loose style construction, you know. And uh, that's, I think, the bulk of people have that. Uh, there's very few people that have a, a very energy efficient home. Hopefully that's changing over time, but we deal with what we have. So, um, so I think a lot of people are going to be dealing with that loose construction. Uh, we're also going to be talking about uh, kind of what CSM or CFM and airflow means. So uh, on that note, um, talking about air and air conditioning, um, when you have, you know, a loose construction home, again, you know, if you cool that house down or you warm that house up, uh, you're going to lose a lot of that. So it, it, there's a, not to get off in the weeds too much, we'll break it down and make it simple. Air goes from hot to cold in that direction. So if you have a cold interior of your home and it's hot outside, that air is moving, trying to move into that home in reverse in the winter, trying to move out. That's a bit important, but not necessarily for us right now, but just to kind of understand that. So we're, we're going to start with ventilation. So, you know, a lot of times people really don't think about ventilation and ventilation can be a lot of different things. Old school ventilation is, hey, open the window, open the door, right? We need some fresh air in this house, right? Then it moves to, oh, we want to move air around. So let's turn on the, the fan in the furnace. We talk about that in, in uh, you know, furnace class, uh, heating class, to be able to move that air around. It's not really ventilation, but it's moving that air, right? And most people, I think, think about that as far as, you know, the, the mechanical means to be able to get fresh air into their house. And they think about windows or doors or screen doors, whatever. Now, the, the issue is, is that the indoor air quality is usually pretty bad, and it seems to be getting worse. And what I mean by that is the, the products that we bring into the home. I don't care if the home's, you know, 100 years old, right? It's off gas pretty much everything it's going to, right? So if the home is not necessarily creating that issue. New construction? Yeah, it will for a little while. It'll off gas a bunch of things. But the items you bring into your home, you know, new chair, new desk, uh, particle board this or whatever, new carpet, whatever it is, right? And that off gases sends out, uh, you know, some pretty nasty stuff. And that indoor air pollution can get pretty high. That is where ventilation comes into play. And if you have, if you have that, you know, that higher indoor air pollution, you want ways to be able to get rid of it. And again, you can open the window and all that sort of stuff, right? But sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes you physically can't do that. I've seen homes where you can't open the windows even if you tried, other than breaking them. So sometimes you have to get into uh, mechanical means to be able to get that out. And other, other forms or other things that you'd want to get out of your home boil down to uh, moisture. So moisture is a big one. And a lot of people don't think of this. Moisture, whether it's bulk moisture or, or uh, vapor in your home, is not a good thing. You want to get that out. So we do things like, let's use a bath fan, right? So we have a simple bath fan, you know, kick that on so it's getting all that moisture that, you know, was created by the shower or whatever. Um, we also have other means like a, a hood vent, and we'll talk about that a little more. Oh, it's over your stove, right? But here's the question to think about. So I'll, I'll pick on bath fans. I'm kind of jumping a little bit, you know, said with your outline, but I'm standing right next to it, so that's what I'm going to talk about. So bath fans are designed to be able to get that moisture, one of the ways to be able to get moisture out of your home. And, you know, I mean, this is, this is a, you know, the guts basically to a bath fan. You have what's called a little squirrel cage right here. Can you see way back there? 
Okay. So, yeah, you have a little squirrel cage that spins. It picks that air up and expels it outside, hopefully. Bath fans, a lot of people, I don't mean to be crude, but a lot of people think the only thing they're good for is to get smells out of the bathroom. Well, yeah, they're good for that too, but you have to think of it as a, as a, uh, a tool to be able to get, help get that moisture out. So what can happen is, is that you can have bath fans that don't necessarily work. Their motors seize up, uh, they're loud, so people don't want to use them because they're annoying. And they don't seem like they do much. So I've found a lot of times in the older homes, what happens is, is people won't use them, and then that vapor builds up and creates mold issues and all sorts of other issues, right, inside that home. So what can you do as a homeowner to kind of make it so that, yeah, you can pass that guy around, so that you can make it so that, um, that, uh, that bath fan is actually working the way it needs to. So, a couple little things. It all boils, really boils down to, the, this is called that squirrel cage, right? Different sizes, all sorts of different things. So, this is a pretty typical bath fan. This is what you see from down below. They dump it into the attic, which causes a whole other array of issues, right? So, you know, I would say if you don't know, go home, take a look. You can look. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different styles out there, but here's one, you know, that when it's running, these little fins pop open, and you can feel it exhausting. You can see it, you know. Uh, there's other styles out there. This is just one they had. But you want to see where that bath fan is going. All right. If it is not exhausting to the outside, it's one of those things that you may want to when you've got a second, or maybe you're getting your roof done or something along that line. That's a good time to be able to say, hey, you know, I want to run this bath fan out. Because, again, it, it, it causes major damage to roof decks and all sorts of things, and I can't get into all that, but it's not good. So, you know, by having that bath fan so it can actually work, and actually exhaust the outside is a good thing. And then the maintenance on it, simple. Pretty simple as far as cleaning those fins on the, uh, the little squirrel cage. And, you know, if it's loud and whatnot, sometimes you can get in there and be able to change those motors out. There's little motors in there. And they're pretty easy usually to pull them apart. You can take them down someplace and say, I need this. The model number and everything else is on there so you can replace those motors and it's not hard most of them are a simple plug-in style yeah so i mean you can vent a couple of different ways uh you know you can vent either through your gable end or you can vent up like through the roof and i mean here's here's an example of this is for a hood vent but a smaller version of this, and it sits up on your roof and then connects up. So there's multiple ways to be able to run it. Um, 
But yes, yeah, you can run it in different ways. I'm going to get into a little more detail on that. Was a question you had? Yep. Yeah, sometimes. Um, like we have a place here in town called Kamzu Electric Motor. And sometimes they can find that stuff a lot easier. We live in the wonderful world of Google. You can... Google the number on it and usually find it on something like Amazon or something like that. It, it, it's, yeah, it's getting a lot easier to be able to deal with that sort of stuff. But you can usually find those motors to be able to change them out. You can also take it in and say, it's broke. Can you please put a new motor in and there are places that yeah, we'll pull it apart and do all that sort of stuff. Because sometimes, usually the hardest part in all that is getting this off of the old motor. That can be a bear sometimes. But... Yeah, so, I mean, there are ways to be able to do it. You don't necessarily have to change your, your whole bath fan. If you don't have a bath fan, might be a good investment. That would be one of those things. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on that a little bit. You want to look at CFM. So, cubic foot feet per minute. How much air does that fan move? Now, they may say it, you know, it moves, you know, 70 CFM per minute or 100 CFM per minute, right? The higher the number, the more air it moves. So you have to kind of take a calculation. You know, in my bathroom, I have eight-foot ceilings, and it's, you know, 12 by 10 or whatever. And you figure it out. And you say, this is how many cubic feet I have. And you kind of do the math, and you get that figured out. The thing to realize about these is when they test these to find out what their CFM is, they test them. They put them on a bench just like this, nothing hooked up to it, plug it in, put a thing on there to read how much air is moving through it, and they say, yep, that's how much it is. But the kicker on all that is as soon as you put a pipe on it, like some kind of a hard pipe or whatever, which is what it should be, every, and I don't quote, it's been a long time since I've, I've had these numbers, but it's like for every 10 feet, it drops, you know, and for every elbow, it drops. That air is restricted, right? So let's say you were talking about going out of the gable end, right? So your, your bathroom's on one end of the house, and you want to go all the way to the other end of the house. That may not be a good idea because, you know, your 100 CFM bath fan all of a sudden with all that run and those elbows and whatever else you need to do to be able to get to that point, drops it down to almost nothing. So my key is, or my, my point on all this is, you always want to make whatever uh, your, uh, your bath fan is going to the outside as short as possible and with as, mi as minimal amounts of bends in it. So that's kind of a rough way to look at it. Ideally, it's an insulated, uh, wrapped pipe. You can get like a flexible pipe or something like that that has insulation around it already. That's good because you get warm, moist air moving through like a pipe. Let's say a pipe, a hard pipe like that, and it's in a cold attic. What do you think is going to happen? Condensation, water issues, all sorts of things, right? So there's, again, there's always flip sides and stuff. So, you know, and, and it, it is amazing how much damage just water vapor can do to a home. So that's one way of thinking of that. The other is, is sometimes, I'll touch on this just real quick, sometimes a home, oh, this is going to fall and make a lot of noise. Sometimes a home is really energy efficient, right? So we talk about this in weatherization class as far as making that house tighter, making it more energy efficient. So sometimes you may go, I'm, I, I want to turn this house into a real energy efficient home. Great. Nothing wrong with that. But the issue is, is now you have to deal with, you're not getting fresh air from outside. It's not just migrating through very easily, right? So you, you work on something that is, uh, it's called an HRV or an ERV. There's two different types. I'm not going to get into the details on them. To make something <laughs> complicated, really short, 
It pulls in fresh air from the outside and expels that stale air from the inside. The air never mixes. What it does is it pulls it in. It goes through a core. And I'm going to pull this off on my lap. It goes through a core. But this particular one's a metal core. Kind of looks like a radiator, right? And the air never mixes, but what there's a... There's a product in here that makes it so that that heat transfer that I was talking about, hot to cold. So it, 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 it tempers that air a little bit. So let's say it's two degrees outside. You're not bringing in two degree air. You might be bringing in 40 degree air, right? And vice versa. You're not dumping your hot air outside or cold air outside, right? So that air goes through, transfers that heat back and forth, bringing that fresh air in expelling that stale air out. A lot of times it's dumped into the return of the home, of the uh, furnace system. And then it's run through and either heated up or cooled down. And that can be, think of that just like a very large, sophisticated bath fan. <laughs> it's the easiest way. But that's one of those things that you, you just don't want to automatically go out and get. This is one of these things where uh, usually you have a, uh, a person come out and they'll do what's called a blower door test. And they'll figure out how tight that house is. And they'll say, all right, you want to start thinking about an HRV or an ERV. So it's another way of doing that. Maintenance on it's pretty straightforward. It's uh, you have these little pre-filters. And they could be look like this or something else. You change these out eh, once every 30 days or so, clean them out, you know. And then this core, some are washable, some are you clean them with a vacuum. They're usually about once a year. Simple. So, but it, it makes a difference. It's one of those things that, you ever been in a house that's just stuffy? It just doesn't feel right? <laughs> that's usually that indoor air pollution, and that really helps with that. So, like I said, an HRV or an ERV is a nice way uh, to be able to uh, get some of that fresh air in and get some of that stale air out. So, and we could have a whole class just on these, but you get the gist of it, right? So, and you can kind of see we got it, you know, here is kind of showing how it goes. A lot of times they're put in basements and whatnot. Um, we talked about bath fans already. Um, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, you know, how, how, do, how long do you know to run a bath fan? Usually the, the answer I give people is at least until, like, all the fog on the mirror disappears. But here's the cool thing. So let's say you have a bath fan. It's just a piece of junk. And you're like, I want to get a new one. Okay. You're going to look at the CFMs. You're going to look at the, all that sort of stuff. But they have bath fans out there that you, you put in, and it has a little module in there, and it's a motion detector. So when somebody walks in the bathroom, a little DC motor kicks on and runs at low speeds because it sensed movement in that bathroom. Again, not to be crude, that's for smells, right? But it also has a little module in there that is a humidistat. And let's say somebody jumps in the shower and it go and that humidity level starts rising. That bath fan goes off and kicks up onto a higher speed when that humidity level is reached, and that's something you can preset, right? And it runs until that humidity level drops. And it's one of those really nice things. And you can even go a step further. What we used to do at Habitat was we would put those style fans in. We would hardwire them in so there wasn't a switch on the wall. They were usually hardwired in with the lights where I guess you could go to the circuit breaker and turn it off if your lights wouldn't work. So it's one of those things you don't have to remember to kick that bath fan down. There's always little ways, little tricks you can do. And that's a nice way to be able to do that. So it's just a, a, another thing that's out there. They're actually a Panasonic brand uh, that will do that. They're a little pricey, but you think about the damage that can be done, and it's, 
it's automated. That makes life a lot easier. So, um, if you have, you know, if you're running through your attic and that sort of stuff, um, be very careful about using a, a flexible style uh, ducting. The reason I say that is, we'll go back to this guy, right? So we have these. You can pop these off. And we'll get into why you want to pop these off later. So, and, you know, this is on the side of your house or whatever. Connect up to the heart pipe. Well, these things can fall off sometimes. Even the ones that are a solid piece or they go in from underneath. There's a little screen in there. The issue is birds can get in there. And if it's, a, if it's some kind of a plastic coil, I'm not saying like this, but similar to this, birds will get in there and peck it to death. And all of a sudden you got the same issue. You got all your warm, moist air from your bathroom dumping in your attic again. So that's where hard piping comes in. So, um, so yeah, if you're going to have it done, run it in hard pipe and have it insulated or something along that line. Because again, you know, just things happen and over time, uh, there can be issues. Um, simple check on that. First, you know, you, you know, you want to see how well your bath fan is working. And this is a crude test, but it works. I call it the two TP test. So what you do is turn on your bath fan and you have the sides here where it's venting, you know, it's pulling that air in and you want to know if it's really moving that air or if those fins have been clogged up to a point where they're not moving anything. So I get two sheets of toilet paper, I turn that fan on, I let it get up to speed. It should be enough to be able to hold that toilet paper up there. Generally, that's a simple, simple way. If it doesn't do that, go to the step of pull that cover off, look, see if those, that squirrel cage is all clogged up. If that looks good, the motor's running, you know you got an issue somewhere in your line, pipe, a bend, somebody stepped on it in the attic, a bird made a nest up there, whatever, right? So that's a nice little simple way to be able to tell, hey, at least it's moving air. So on ventilation note, um, the, the other thing that a, mo a lot of people don't think about are your hood vents. I'm not going to drag it out. Hood vent, right, over your stove. So you have a couple of different styles. You have one that vents just a recirculating. You turn it on, it blows in your face. That's not really ventilation. Does it run through a filter and deal with the grease and stuff? Yeah, it does. But it's not venting it to the outside. Ideally, if you have a hood vent, it's vented to the outside. I've yet to do that on mine. I got to work on it, right? But ideally, it's venting to the outside, just like a bath fan. All the same rules apply as far as all the bends and the lengths of the exhaust and everything else. How you exhaust it, a couple of different ways. This is actually for a hood vent that goes on the roof. And you can see that it's got this nice little screen here, a little flap. And it makes little birds can't get in there and all that sort of stuff. And that's nice. I'll pass this guy around. And another way is, you know, this is where your stove is in the middle of the room. And it goes up and through the roof. Let's say your stove's on an exterior wall. You can get one like this. Similar in a lot of ways. And it goes right to the outside. Because, again, when you're cooking and you're doing all that sort of stuff, you're creating a tremendous amount, depending on what kind of cooking you're doing, of moisture that's just being dumped into the home. And so if you have a hood vent that is vented to the outside in one way or another, you use it. I would really like to see them come up with a hood vent that I was talking about, like those bath fans that had those modules in it, but I haven't seen one yet. Maybe eventually they might get it. So, yeah, when you're cooking, that's the other side of it. Get that, you know, makes, try to make it so you're getting that stuff out of the home. Other... It's not really necessarily ventilation, but I'll talk about it real quick. Dehumidifiers. So 
a lot of times people equate, at least here, summer with high humidity. And you know, sometimes it's just, you may have those days where it's humid. It's not necessarily hot. So sometimes having a dehumidifier in your home can make a huge difference. It's going to pull that moisture out of the air by not necessarily dropping the temperature. It's just pulling that moisture out of the air. Pumping it to either you're dumping it out or it's going to uh, a pump or, you know, it's up on a, uh, a ledge where it can just drain into a sink or something like that, right? A dehumidifier is great. And again, you know, it's that, it's that same idea of you're getting, you're, you're getting rid of that moisture. Um, as far as how much moisture is too much moisture? Me? The way I look at it is you start getting over 50% relative humidity, 50 to 60%-ish. That's when problems start to come up. Mold growth, all sorts of things, right? So, you know, if you're using, let's say, a dehumidifier, uh, and you have that where you can set it, set it down to about 50. I mean, and you have to play with it a little bit. It depends on the home and stuff, but... Um, to me, you know, 50, 55 percent relative humidity is about right. They said once you get up past that 60 mark, issues start popping up. So um, there are even thermostats out there where if you have, let's say you have Wi-Fi at home, most people do in these day and age, you can get a thermostat. It'll send something. Oh, I have my phone on me. Send you an alert on your phone saying, hey, your indoor, you know, your humidity level has shot past 60 percent. Check something. Something's going on, right? But they have thermostats that will do that now. So that's really neat. So, uh, you know, that's another way to be able to help get that moisture out. We talk about this in heating also as far as humidifiers, adding moisture. That's a tricky balance. And I'm not going to get into that right now because we're in summer mode, right? So, uh, but, yeah. Dryer vents are the next one. So there's another little detail on uh, home energy, or uh, I can't think of the word right now. It's been a long day. Remember I said hot goes to, from hot to cold in that direction? Well, you have pressures. You have two different pressures. You have high pressure. You have low pressure. We all know what happens when low pressure comes in and we get storms and everything else, right? Well, the same thing can happen to the house. What I mean by that is it goes from high pressure to low pressure in that direction. Think of it just like a hill, right? Why do I say that? Well, the reason I say that is, is that most homes are on, are, if you were to test the pressure inside, would be less than the pressure outside. Why is that? Because you're running things like your bath fan, you're running things like your hood vent if it's vented to the outside. You're running things like your dryer. So it's putting that house, the inside of your house, on negative pressure, meaning that <laughs> the outside pressure, if it's higher, is one trying to push its way in. Back to how does you know doing weatherization and stuff help you, not only in the winter but in the summer. So um, most of the homes are on negative pressure just because how much air is being expelled out of them. So uh, it's just one of those things to kind of keep in mind. But the dryer is a big one. So dryers, yes, they should be vented to the outside. Please don't. Don't. I don't care if they sell them or not because they do. Don't do the, you know, oh, it dumps into this box. And it catches all the lint and it dumps all this warm air into your house. That warm air can be <laughs> not good because you're, you're putting all that moisture, you're introducing all this moisture into your house. I don't care if it's summer or winter, it doesn't matter. That's, you know, too much is just not good. So vent it to the outside, please. Uh, the other is you want to keep in mind as far as all that good old lint. And this is... Be careful, I'm going to pass this guy around, right? So we all know this, right? The lint is all built up. So there's two parts on this. So one, you got the lint build up. 
two, you got the uh, – you have the um, – <laughs> you have the the means to be able to get rid of that lint. So, and I'll say this in home safety and security also, is one, you should be cleaning that lint filter out. So, again, sometimes they look like this, and you can go from the outside, you can get something like this. This is really short. But you can buy kits where you have multiples of these. You can connect them together. And then what I do is I turn the dryer on, and I get in there, and I clean it out. And, you know, you can get ones that are, you know, you can get 12 foot long, right? Some you can hook to a drill. I usually just do it by hand. But it's important to have that dryer running. You just clean it out, and it's spitting out lint all over the place and stuff. But it makes it so it's not going to cause a fire, right? Yeah. Yep, that catches all the lint. It doesn't catch all of it. It ends up in your pipe. I don't care if it's a hard pipe or, you know, black pipe. The other part is, so you want to clean that lint out, basically. And you can do that once a year. It kind of depends on you know, how many fuzzy sweaters you have or, or whatever. But uh, uh, the other part is, and this is going away slowly but surely. Anybody got a uh, dryer vent that's like this? It's vinyl, sort of with a wire mesh. If you have that, please, when you get home, go, at least go out and you can find a metal version of this. That's at least a little better. It almost looks like tin foil with this with this wire coating in it that keeps it. Um, this is a tremendous fire hazard. That lint will build up, catch and catch everything on fire and burn your house down quicker than you can. Yeah. Yep. So I mean, this is horrible. Next step up is is some. It looks like aluminum foil with a coil in it. That's a little better. Then you have what looks like an accordion that's made out of aluminum. That's a little better than that. Ideally, it is made out of some kind of a hard pipe. You know, and but the thing with that is, is that if you, you know, say you look at it, you say, I want a hard pipe. I want a you know, four inch hard pipe. I can go to the store, I can buy it, and I can put it in. Cool. But make sure it's either galvanized. You can tell galvanized because it's got this checkered coating on it right or aluminum if it is just straight metal that warm moist air is going to rot it out right um hard piping is the best uh the other little detail is is that when they're putting them together don't put screws in them because again it's just a catch point so i'm drifting a little bit into another class but anyways <laughs> yep yep Yep. Yeah, and it has uh, all that stuff going around. Yep. 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 You probably got this little piece like this. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and I mean, we talk about this more in home safety and security as far as little details you want to get into, but keep that in mind. And then, you know, all these same things going into play as far as the more winding, whatnot there is, the least, uh, the, the, uh, the least effective your dryer is going to be, the less effective your dryer is going to be, because, again, it's just having to push through all that space. So... Now we got into air conditioners, right? Ventilation's a big part of all this, right? So air conditioners. So there's multiple types of air conditioners out there. Anybody got central air in their house? A couple of you? All right. The rest of you window bangers or no air conditioning whatsoever? A little port yeah, they're window units and portable ones are similar in a lot of ways. So you have all air conditioning is I want to draw something that's really basic. Don't laugh too hard at my artwork. Oh, wait, maybe I'm going to draw. Oh, yeah, I'm going to draw something. So you have two parts here in air conditioning. And this is, again, really super simple, right? You have your A coil. That's the base. Central air, it looks like this, or it may be just a flat piece, right? 
Your air goes through that and cools down or gives off that heat. Hot air goes through the cool refrigerant, loses its heat. So you have that point. I'll show you what that looks like. And you have lines that are going to outside. We're talking central air right now. And you have what's called a condensing unit outside. Looks like this motor, fan, fins on the side. This. And it's just a loop. It just keeps going, loop, loop, loop. So what happens is, is that you have refrigerant in, in the line. I'll pick on, I'll pick on these, uh, this unit because, again, once you understand these basics, it all transfers over to the window units or the portable units or something along that line. So what we're looking at here, and you may want to come up here to look at this a little closer, is you have these fins, and it has uh, your, your coils that have the refrigerant in them. In your air, this is the A coil for here. So that air moves through and up through. It's moving up through this. I just have it sitting on like this. Moves through there. Gives up its heat. Comes up through. Distributed through your home. Right? That refrigerant, in a sense, warms up in this part. Then it moves out to your condensing unit outside. And there, what happens is you have air. This fan moves, pulls air through these sides, through these fins. And that heat is given to the air. So that hot, it pulls that hot out of that refrigerant, if that makes sense, right? Blows out, cools that refrigerant down a little bit, heads back to the egg coil, and starts over again. There's more details, but you don't need to really deal with that. So I don't care if it's a window unit or a portable unit, it's basically how they work. So it's all about airflow. Why do I say that? The reason I say that is, is that there are a couple things that homeowners do uh, that can really mess up their air conditioning. Probably the biggest one are your air filters. We'll talk about that in a minute. Second biggest one usually is this condensing unit outside. And what I mean by that is, remember I was talking, it's all about air. It's all about that air moving. So let's say you have this condensing unit outside. And you can see this one. It has stuff on the outside and whatnot. If you live around here in cottonwoods and they're floating all over the place, you may walk outside and look at this. And it's just totally covered in fuzz for whatever reason. You think that air is moving through and cooling that refrigerant down? Probably not very effectively. So generally, if you have a condensing or central air, you want to keep the area around your condensing unit clear of plants and stuff. And that's the first thing I'll look at. Because again, I see it where, you know, they say, oh, air conditioning is not working real well. It's kind of kind of warm in here and stuff and you go okay you kick the air on and you walk outside and they have plantings all around it because it's ugly they don't want to see it and all those plants are like sear sucked to the side well yeah that might be part of your problem right there because the air can't move through so keep it clear i usually keep it clear a foot or two you know around it the other part is is that if there's stuff on these fins you, as a homeowner, can easily shut off the power to it, go to your panel box, shut that off, and you can get a hose, spray it. Sometimes all it needs is just a spray to be able to wash that stuff off, right? If you're doing that, don't get right up to it and blast it this way so that, air, so that water's going this way. I usually go at a little bit of an angle. The reason for that is, again, we're back to fins. And if you have a fin, and again, this is going to be... I'll draw it over. Can you see over here? So let's say these are your fins, right? And say this is the outside. This is the inside of the unit. And then there's your tubes running through, right? So let's say you get crud on the outside and it's stuck and whatnot, right? And let's say you're cleaning it off. If you blast it straight in, sometimes what it will do is it will push that stuff deeper into that fin and not necessarily flush it out the backside. 
So, you know, I usually tell if, you, if a homeowner is that something they want to do, that's that keeping that nice steady stream at an angle like this so you're, you're washing it down instead of pushing it in. Well, you could, you have to be careful. There's a grid around it, so that makes it, that makes it a little difficult. You can have a little bristle on it, and that could work. Um, the, uh, the, the issue is with these, if you push on it too much, you're going to bend those fins over. Then we're back to the same issue of that air is not going to move through. So that's why I get a little worried about people using a vacuum or something because they bang into those fins and yes, there's tools to straighten them out, but usually you're calling a, a, an HVAC person to be able to come out and do that. Um, so keeping this clear. Keeping this clean is one of those things that you can do pretty easily. Now, should you have somebody come out once a year and do that check? They check the refrigerant inside, which you can't do because you can't buy it <laughs> if, unless you have a, a license for it. Um, so, yeah, you know, that's that whole thing of get it set up to where they come out once a year if you have central air, and they'll do those checks. Sometimes they're going to clean it off. Sometimes they'll, you know, they're, they're always going to check the refrigerant levels to make sure if you have a leak or whatever. And just to make sure it's actually working the way it needs to work. Your A-coil, you can't really do much with the A-coil as, as a homeowner. And again, you know, I mean, here it is right here, right? We, we saw what it looked like on the underside. Are you getting to that underside very easily? Not very easily. <laughs> it's not like you can take a cover off. Because if you took the cover off, this is what you'd see, right? But it's the same concept. You have those fins, just like those fins. And air needs to be able to pass through there. If that air can't pass through there, it's not doing its job. It's not cooling that air down. Now, how does this get clogged up? We were talking about the outside elements that clog up your condensing unit. How does this get clogged up? It's somewhat of a sealed system, right? Sort of. This is where the air filters come in. So again, if you have central air, a lot of people think you know, or understand, hey, I have, to, I have to change my furnace filters for my heating. And they're right. But air conditioning is just as important. What happens is, is that let's say you have a clogged air filter and it is that motor is pulling and it's just not letting enough air through that A coil to cool it down. Your refrigerant is not warming up in a sense and you have <laughs> relatively cold refrigerant coming to this unit. And what happens is, is that it starts building up ice. So that's the other thing is that if you have central air, I don't care, any kind of air, if it has some kind of a filter to it, change that. You should be cleaning that filter. And again, it depends on what style filter, thicker filters, thinner filters, that sort of stuff, how many cats you have. This is an example of a horrible filter. This will kill your air conditioning unit real fast, right? So change that filter. Make sure that filter is... You know, that air can pass through that filter. How much level of protection you want, how, as far as what it pulls out of the air, that's up to you. I will say this. The ones I have a tendency to kind of stay away from are these guys. And why is that? There is not much in here that's going to stop much, right? And where is it going to end up? All on the bottom side of this because that air is moving this way, right? And it will. I've seen these where we pull them out. And it is just nothing but like cat hair on the bottom of that because they either ran their filter, their furnace without their filter in, or they got really super small or cheap filters that either weren't the right size, or weren't the right style. A lot of stuff got by them and then ended up <laughs> stuck to it and air conditioning is not cheap to replace. So keep those air filters cleaned out. So that's central air. All the same rules apply with a window unit, right? 
So with the window unit, I don't want to break this. <laughs> your, yeah, I'm not going to pull this. Your A coil is inside here, right? And there's usually some means, and I'm not, here it goes. There it is. I say there's usually some means. This one has a little filter, you know, a little washable filter. There's your A coil. That cools your air down, and you can see, if you look at this, this is. Is <laughs> just like your central air, that big unit that sits outside. The thing with window units is that this is exposed. So I see it a lot of a lot of window units where you know kids are in the backyard kicking the ball or whatever, and and, and this ends up all these fins are all bent. So if you have a window unit, it doesn't quite work real well anymore. You know, some of the simple check is a is my filter. That little pre-filter that we have there, is that clean? Is my A-coil clean? My condensing side clean was on the outside. Or is it bent? You know? And you can go to the box stores and buy little little tools. They look like, uh, remember those lice brushes they had? <laughs> like for the kids, I got lice and something. It looks like those. And you go through and you straighten those fins out, right? And you can do that. And you can clean this off just like, you know, anything else. So, like I said, refrigeration in a lot of ways, pretty basic. Those portable units, same deal. They have a condenser. They have an evaporator. They have, equator, they have all that sort of stuff. So, keeping that airflow, keeping it so that air can move is real important. The other thing about these window units is... Um, when you're installing them, and most people understand this, but I've seen a lot of damage, so I have to say it. This backside needs to be tilted just a little bit. The reason is, is that when you pull moisture out of the air, what is your byproduct? What would you think? Water, right? Same thing with a window unit. If that thing's sitting in the window, let's say this is your inside, and that thing's tilted just a little bit like this, where's that water going? right inside your house. So window units, they need just a little bit of a tilt because if you were to look at it on the bottom side or on the side here, there's means to be able to drain that out. So, uh, you know, all of them are a little different, but if you have one of these, take a look at it because what happens is you get stuff that gets in there. And I've seen it where those little ports where the drain ports get clogged up with just guck. And that water goes somewhere. It usually goes into your house. <laughs> so it should be tilted to the outside just a little bit. And if you drain out and then your drain or your weep holes should be cleared out. And it's kind of that yearly maintenance thing. In the winter, pull it out if you can. I don't know how many times I see window units just sitting there all winter long, you know. Letting all that cold air in. <laughs> or out. So. Yep. Yep. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, I could. Yep. Yep. Air movement, yeah. Does your 
And you might, yeah, you might be able to get away with that. You might not. I mean, it's just one of those things. And, uh, you know, a lot of times, too, it depends on if you, obviously, you have a furnace. If your furnace is wired up correctly, or not correctly, wired up in a way where you can just turn on where it just moves that air and it's not heating or it's not cooling, it's just moving air. Right. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. So, yeah, I mean, that can be that can be put in. The question was is where do attic fans kind of play into all this. Um, that's kind of the ventilation side of it also. Um, you want to get that. Basically, you want your attic to be as cool as possible. Simplest way to look at it. So in that summer, that heat kicks up. And, you know, you have rough vents and all this sort of stuff. But what some people will do is they'll put on uh a a bath uh, oh i'm sorry uh, uh, an exhaust fan either it's a gable end or something that helps pull that air that hot air out of that attic and yeah that helps because well we're drifting into yet another class but um you ever notice if you don't have air conditioning how you know a nice hot day and the house may be all right because you don't open the windows and stuff and it feels good until about 6, 6.30, 7 o'clock, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, back to that. That attic is heated up now to, what, 120 degrees, and your relatively cool house is at, you know, 72, 73, something along that line. What's, gonna, what's all that heat going to do? Push right into the house, starting from your attic. So getting that, air, that hot air out of your attic, the ventilation side of things, makes it, so it's a little more effective as far as cooling that house down. All this stuff ties together. It all ties together. So and that's part of what we tried to talk about here. So, um, so yeah, you know, like I said, it, yeah, it shows a breakdown in all this. And you can have these serviced also, you know, if that's what you like as far as the window units, great. Or the portable units, great. Um, as far as... Um, I will say this. We have just a few minutes left. Well, yeah, we have a couple minutes left. Um, if you get new air conditioning, all right, let's say you, you decide I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get central air, I'm going to get a new unit, or you have to get something replaced. Um, if you are thinking about doing weatherization or, or energy efficiency uh, methods that you want to do to your home, I would suggest getting those done first. The reason is, is that a lot of times, and I kind of, I kind of say old school uh, HVAC people, um, they will just throw in a large unit. They'll go, all oh, your house is, you know, it's big. Yep, you need a giant unit, right? And what happens is, is that if the unit is too large for the space that it's conditioning, what happens is, is that it drops drops the temperature down real fast but it doesn't pull that humidity out that's the second part of that air conditioning that makes it feel comfortable you ever walked into a house and sure it feels cool but it's a clammy sort of feeling that's an indication that that air conditioning unit is too big and it's just dropping the temperature without pulling that moisture that humidity out of the air so but it can be changed you know i've seen it where people buy a unit brand new unit and then they start going after their house and they're making it more and more and more energy efficient and that's relatively easy to do now all of a sudden their unit that used to be fine starts to act like that oversized unit because you're making your house more efficient where the unit is now oversized so that's where that's where i'm getting at with that so mess around with the duct work also yep yep that can be the case that sometimes that can be the case especially in those older homes yeah yeah yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, so you know, if you're doing it right, um, they will do what's called a manual, you know, manual J calculation, and I'm sure there's another word for it that I'm not thinking of right now. They'll actually take a lot of that into account. You know, um, I would say if you're really, if you are truly serious about it, um, you know, if you're having a company come out, talk to them. How do you size the furnace? How do you size the air conditioner? You know, if they go, oh, you got, you know, you got a 1,100-square-foot house, you need this big of a unit. At that point, I'd kind of go, and? <laughs> so, you know, if they say, we take calculations, we bring somebody in, and they do a blower door test or whatever, you know, we, you know, because they, they, there's a lot of things to take into account. How the ductwork is, you know, how many south-facing windows you have, how loose the house is, how tight the house is. There's all those little things to think about. But, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, they're getting better at it. Mm -hmm. It's all rotted out. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of times they ran, you know, a lot of times in the old houses, what they would do in, the, in that, is they would have your floor joists, and they'd get a piece of sheet metal, and they'd done that for a long, long time. And they'd use that joist, that space between that joist, to move that air towards the furnace. And now with a more, you know, with a more modern home that's you know new construction, I can't really do that anymore. <laughs> it's not really suggested anymore. It needs to be ducted, actually ducted. So, um, but yeah, all that, all that comes into play. So. It is boxed in, but it's not it's not a duct necessarily. It's just using it as a chase. Yep. That's something that they have to look at and it you know it boils down to a lot of different things. But if you have a good company, they'll look at that. But again, you know, it's gonna up the cost. I, if you don't understand duck sizing and all that sort of stuff, I wouldn't touch it. You can cause more damage than good. So, yeah. So, I mean, does that make sense in, in, in the little bit of time that we had as far as, you know, making sure you're cleaning those, changing those air filters, understanding condensing unit, that sort of stuff, and, and you know, really what air conditioning is. And a lot of times, I'll say this as far as the last thing because we are about done. With a lot of the new... Uh, air conditioning units they're designed to run longer so there is this is kind of a weird you know something that homeowners have to get used to they may be used to an oversized unit that would run for 15 minutes and cool the whole house down and shut off some of the newer units are designed to run at a lower use less energy lower whatever and they run for a longer period of time because they're working on getting that moisture out of the air, the humidity out of the air, and they may have to run longer. And it seems counterintuitive. My, my new air conditioning is supposed to be energy efficient, and that thing, I don't think I've ever heard it shut off during real hot times of the summer. Sometimes that's the way they're designed. So, hopefully this was helpful. <laughs> it usually brings up a lot more questions than anything, so, but, uh, yeah, any other questions at all? All right, cool. Yeah. Yep. So, okay, so you're saying how often should you be changing that filter? All right. You have a filter that's this size, like thick, like this, or thicker? Well, well I'm not saying size-wise. I'm saying thickness-wise. Is it one inch like this? Oh, it's a thicker one like this? Okay, so these usually are about six months, sometimes a year. It just depends. Um, you know, you can look at them. You can pull them out. You can do that simple test where you hold it up to a light, and you should be able to see that light through it versus a cruddy guy like this where I can hold that up to the light, and I can barely see through it. So, it, 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 again, it, it depends a little bit. 
You know, it can get a little tricky with these, but, you know, most of the time, over time, you're going to learn how how often you're going to have to change it because so much of it boils down to... That's right. Yep. So. All right. Oh. Yeah. So the question is, should filters be replaced sooner with the air quality issues caused by the wildfire smoke? Yeah, so I mean, you can get filters that uh, you can get filters that are super tight, I guess, if you want to say it, that will pull out those uh, those very very small small particles. This fire, this smoke fire, you're talking like HEPA filters. Most of these furnace filters aren't going to necessarily filter that out. Um, I mean, I imagine it might contribute to clogging it up a little bit, but they're so small. Now, if you have filters that are, there are some filters out there where they'll say, you know, as far as how small they get down to the micron level of, of uh, the particulate that it will pull out. If you have one that is, you know, down to very, very small particles, yeah, that filter may get clogged up a lot quicker. That's the flip side of you get a really nice filter that's going to pull and clean that air really well. It's going to clog up faster. So, you know, I usually go for some mid-grade. Usually, the, you know, usually you don't necessarily need that, that real high filtration unless somebody in the house has, like, medical issues, that sort of stuff. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you want to, you can make your air in your house like a hospital. That all boils down to the filters they use, really. So, but, yeah. I'll stop. No, no. I was just going <laughs> to um, say, Mr. Taylor, we are so fortunate to have you and the infinite amount of wisdom that you have on all things that have to do with keeping our home safe and sustainable. So I wanted to take the opportunity to thank all of the people that came out to see us. We, I wanted to gently remind our virtual um participants that we do have in-house classes that meet on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. We're right here at 812 Bryant Street, so I would love to see your face in the place. I look forward to seeing you guys um, in a few weeks because next Tuesday is the 4th of July, so we will not, oh, yeah. We yeah. Will not be here, but we will see you um, the following week. So I hope that everyone has a safe holiday, and we will see you soon.